It's been almost two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. Right now it's still holding on to some net territory gains compared to the situation before the invasion. Whether Russia will lose more of those gains or whether it will somehow manage to increase them, those changes will still represent fairly incremental changes. On the other hand, there is a bucket full of economic, geopolitical and military changes that Russia is now facing, precisely because of the invasion. So depending on the viewpoint, some might say Russia has already lost, despite those territorial gains. Furthermore, some might say Russia didn't lose because of battlefield losses, nor because of sanctions or potential economic woes. Long-term geopolitics is where it lost a lot. Internal instability may cost it. NATO expansion will cost it definitely. And ultimately, Russia lost when it comes to its relationship with the Ukrainian people. This video will list all those points, analyze them and try to show if all those outweigh whatever gains Russia has now and thus whether Russia has essentially already lost. Hey, what is this? A cute bink of plushie? Well, I guess I could use an adjutant. Come here, little fella, I'll take you home. And you too can take your own bink of adjutant. Available at Crowdmade store. Yep, we made a bink of plushie. If you want one, for yourself or as a gift, do check out our Crowdmate store. The link is available below in the video description. It's not too small, not too big, perfect for your desk or your shelf next to your military history books. Or you can give it away. We've made it as low cost as humanly possible, which is very hard when you're contracting very small production runs. Well, go ahead and treat yourself. In 2014, Russia invaded for the first time. It got off almost scot-free when it took Crimea, with the West making little noise about it. Whatever sanctions happened were more like a slap on the wrist, rather than anything else. Donbass region was also a big bonus, even though it wasn't integrated into Russia. So in 2022, one could sort of understand what Putin was going for, his gamble to try it once again only on a larger scale, trying to take control of Ukraine's government. And even if that fails, at least taking control of further huge chunks of Ukraine's territory. Of course, that gambit mostly failed. Russia had to give up on the goal of controlling Ukraine's government completely. And even much of the early territorial gains melted away. From the initial 100,000 square kilometers taken at the end of March, Russia is now at little over 65,000 square kilometers taken, compared to its controlled territory just prior to the invasion. Territory itself is worth something, of course, but even if Russia somehow holds on to it and Ukraine doesn't manage to advance anymore, it's really far from being worth it on its own. Russia holds a better part of the Kherson region, but without the city of Kherson itself. Plausibly, up to half a million residents may have been residing in the Russian-controlled Kherson region prior to the war and have been willing to live under Russian administration. The region is quite flat and full of farmland. That's a gain worth something, but it's not really as if Russia is lacking farmland. Zaporizhia region is again controlled only partially, missing the Zaporizhia city. So maybe another half a million or up to 700,000 residents may have decided to stay with the Russian administration. The Donetsk region is again partially controlled, but a good part of the region, including the city of Donetsk, was already under de facto Russian control even before 2022, back when it was the self-proclaimed Republic of Donetsk. So what little population Russian effort added over that is not much. With residents fleeing the war, it's plausibly under 100,000 people. The Luhansk region to the north was again partially controlled by Russian forces to begin with, before 2022. Most of it is now under Russian control, but overall maybe half a million or so residents were added. Having control over some mines, farmland and such, that's useful, but it's really not crucial to Russia, with all its natural riches it already has. Oil refineries like the one in Lysychansk, which Russia took, aren't that small. That particular one had the capacity of refining 16 million tons of oil before it was damaged. Entire Russia refined 290 million tons of oil in 2021. 
So adding a few percent of coal and other mines like anthracite mines in Donbass, adding a few percent of refining potential, a few percent of farmland and a few more percent bigger market and population pool, that's all useful but it doesn't constitute a major industrial or economic addition. Because at the same time Russia lost a lot in this war. We'll look into several items but let's start with the least impactful loss, Russian military might. Population can be replenished over time, as countless wars in the past showed. Still, over half a million wounded and dead by the time war ends is not insignificant. Those people would have otherwise contributed to the economy. Now they will be a monetary strain for decades, accounting for veterancy and medical costs. That sounds cynical, of course, as every life is precious. But history taught us that in wars, deaths become mere statistics. Trained troop losses? Russia sent many of its best trained troops early on into Ukraine, and a good deal of them were lost during 2022. Yes, that's gonna hurt, but on the flip side, many more troops from the frontline grunts to officers got invaluable war experience. So one could say that training and experience-wise, the Russian military personnel will likely come out of the war better trained than it was. In a way, the war uncovered many issues Russian military had which were swept under the rug of corruption. Now some of those issues will get rectified, like the importance and usage of drones, counter-battery radars, artillery in general, limited air force capability, quality officers and so on. Actual numbers of equipment lost, while a big hit to Russian military capabilities, are again not going to be a huge deal in the medium term. Of course all those losses we are about to list are not necessarily definitive. Further losses may have occurred, which lack visual evidence. Sites such as war spotting, which seems to be a bit more thorough to us than Oryx, rely on such visual materials gathered. Lost airplane numbers, for example, aren't horrible for Russia. Out of some 950 tactical combat planes they used before the war, around 70 were damaged or destroyed so far. Attack helicopter losses are worse, however, at some 70 lost and over 15 damaged which represents over a fifth of all Russian pre-war attack helicopter numbers. Those numbers will take several years of future production to be replenished. Armor has been particularly hit on the other hand. Some 60% of all starting tanks Russia had in early 2022 have now been destroyed. Some 25% of starting infantry fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers and armored recon vehicles have been destroyed as well. Artillery has also not fared well as is evident from the table shown. Not to mention maritime losses. One of three existing Slava-class cruisers was lost, among several other ships. But equipment and vehicles can also be replenished. Old stocks of tens of thousands of vehicles and artillery pieces that Russia had before the war have been slowly refurbished. And while yes, Russia will easily need another decade of production to actually make and refurbish another 3000 modern tanks to fully compensate for its most modern tanks lost, equipment is still just a tool. So if the military overall is not a huge loss to Russia, what is? Somewhat bigger loss is the economic one. The Russian ruble plummeted since the invasion. Russian federal budget is currently running a 10% deficit. That gap is being plugged with the Russian National Wealth Fund, but it's still a burden. Oil and gas industry is being hit, with Russia currently earning 30% less than the pre-war figures. But over time the average gap got smaller. Part of it is due to fuel prices and part of it is new available customers. Over time Russia will switch to other markets for its fossil fuels even more, and it will probably adapt. Then again, with the oil and gas industry being some 17% of the GDP and half of that being exported, it's likely a few percent of the Russian GDP have been lost to the sanctions, taking into account just the fossil fuels. Fossil fuel exports make up almost 50% of all Russian exports. Overall exports have not been hit as hard it seems. The EU has lowered their trade with Russia by some 60%, losing roughly $160 billion if one compares the pre-war 2021 with a projection for 2023. But China, India and other countries picked up most of the slack. Their growth so far indicates that once 2023 is all tallied up, China trade will have added $120 billion, with India's trade adding another $40 billion over their 2021 trade volume. 
So overall, Russian GDP seems to have adjusted to the war and the sanctions, for now. 2022 saw a fairly large GDP drop of almost 5% at one point, but then in 2023 the drop grew smaller. For the entire 2023 the GDP growth may approach zero, with 2024 and onward perhaps even having slight growth due to the lower starting base. So future years will show just how much sanctions and the wounded economy have damaged Russia. For now those do represent a loss, but in the long run those may not be big blows. Economic and military losses taken on their own may have even been worth the gains. But the military and economic losses are just part of it all. Smaller parts of it, really. And now we're coming to the big issues which have really hurt Russia. Before 2022, despite everything happening in 2014, Russian standing was still pretty good. Russia had some leverage over the EU and even stood more equally with China, India and other countries. Now the EU has more or less decoupled from Russia, so Russia lost much of its political influence it once had. India is taking advantage of Russian oil, enriching Russia in the short term, but also being able to dictate terms as it can always pick other countries' oil if it's not satisfied with the price. India has in the past been buying a lot of Russian weapon equipment. That has started to change. Actually, after seeing how the Russian war equipment performed in Ukraine, many countries may be cutting back on Russian arms purchases. Once a lucrative industry, Russian arms exports may shrink quite a bit after the war. China being able to dictate trade terms is also increasing its political clout inside Russia. For certain high-tech solutions, like semiconductors, Russia can't really turn to anyone else. The value of smuggled and re-exported chips from Turkey, Caucasus states or the Mid-Asia can be enough for the immediate war effort but it is not nearly enough for the entire economy, which is why Russia will rely on China more and more, possibly reaching near-vassal status in the near future. Especially if China and Europe decouple enough economically, so shipping routes through Russia lose their value, and Russia thus loses whatever leverage it had there. Political impacts don't end there. One of the big reasons Putin went for Ukraine, at least nominally, was to keep NATO away from Russian borders. But that backfired. Now, even if Russia manages to keep those few parts of Ukraine as Russian territory, as sort of an increased buffer zone, those territories are really in the wrong locations to do much against NATO. On the other hand, the rest of Ukraine is going to become a NATO affiliate state, if not a NATO member outright. Ukraine's integration into NATO mechanics and logistics has already gone a long way. It's very possible that if any sort of ceasefire is agreed upon in the future, one that would include Russia getting to keep its gains, that would be perceived as such a massive concession to Russia that there would have to be a big concession to Ukraine as well to somehow balance it. And NATO telling Ukraine it would deploy its combat troops in Ukraine after the war might be just the ticket. After all, British government officials have already hinted at plans for British troops operating inside Ukraine perhaps even before the war ends. Even if that doesn't quite pan out, Russia lost some neutral countries or west-leaning countries and turned them into full-fledged NATO countries, or caused them to lean even more towards Ukraine. Ever since World War II, Finland was a neutral country, not wanting to join NATO so it doesn't provoke Russia. Sweden was famously neutral for even longer. That changed, with Finland now becoming a full-fledged NATO member, and Sweden is likely becoming a member in the near future, as Turkey and Hungary are waited upon to ratify the agreement. So instead of keeping NATO from its borders, Russia gained more NATO countries on its borders only up north. Now Russia suddenly got a much longer border with NATO and Europe, growing from a thousand miles to over 1700 miles. That's not counting possible Ukraine's membership and counting Belarus as an extension of Russia. Sweden, Finland and Ukraine taken together are not exactly lightweights. Their tight alignment with NATO will make NATO noticeably more powerful, especially locally in Europe, and even more specifically when over-border threats to Russia are considered. Then there is Turkey, an old NATO member to be sure, but since Erdogan sort of on defense, trading with Russia despite the war and buying Russian military equipment before the war. But now, after 20 months of war, Turkey is sort of slowly choosing a side, 
And with all the military projects it seems to be doing or planning with Ukraine, it seems to be not favoring Russia as much. Even after 2014, Turkey was hedging its bets and increasing its cooperation with Ukraine, seeing Ukraine as a counterweight to Russia and the Black Sea. The war we are seeing today did not dissuade Turkey from that stance. It seems that, on the contrary, Turkey is doubling down on its cooperation with Ukraine, while trying not to anger Russia too much. But Russia is not really in a position to do much in regards to Turkey, as it badly needs open trade routes with Turkey. In 2014, we saw other countries not knowing how to react to Russian invasion of Crimea. The cohesion of the EU was put to the test there, with the result being that the EU was paralyzed in its response and ultimately lacked an unified response. But in 2022 and onward, that did not happen. Such was the scale of Russian involvement in Ukraine that Putin managed to do the unthinkable, actually unite the EU to stand behind a single common goal. That's pretty much the opposite of what Russia had in mind for its long-term geopolitical goals. Ideally, Russia would profit most from a bickering EU and one not reliant on the US. But the invasion has done the opposite. Europe is united against Russia and more tied to the US than ever. Such realignments of countries may go on for a long time, easily decades, possibly a century if the US and China's new Cold War lasts that long. Russia lost its status of a regional power with influence on its immediate neighbors, including the EU and even China, and became a poorer, somewhat isolated country, one that, while large and populous, is not really perceived as much of a geopolitical powerhouse, like it was before the war. Russia didn't lose just externally. Internally, the invasion and the war caused rifts. It's to be expected that as the war goes on, a divide will grow even stronger between those supporting the war and those opposing it, with both sides likely accusing the other of not being patriotic and working against Russia's long-term interests. Politically, Putin's iron grip on power may last for a while more. But precisely due to the increasingly firm grip, the risk of vacuum filling it after Putin goes away increases. Instead of a fairly steady and peaceful change of power, these extreme times, war casualties, economic uncertainties, internal hatred of non-patriots, those may all cause a not-so-peaceful change of power in the future. And if that happens, chances of even more casualties, economic woes and even greater losses for Russia internationally increase. Finally, there is Ukraine, as in Ukrainian people. There were serious issues between Ukrainians and the Russian Empire and Soviet elites throughout the centuries. But when Ukrainian people mostly chose to go their own way, leaving the Soviet Union, the Russian people were still seen as largely friendly, as there was a lot of mixing of the two peoples in the past, a lot of cultural ties and the fact that past transgressions sort of tend to be forgotten after a few decades. Still, the 1990s and 2000s saw the independent states of Ukraine and Russia slowly grow apart, quarreling on gas deals, Ukraine's trade with the EU, the war in Georgia and so on. Ukrainians and Russians were getting more and more divided by the policies of their respective governments. Then the 2014 revolution happened, followed closely by the Russian invasion of Crimea and the subsequent war in Donbass. From then on, there was almost no turning back. But even if there was a glimmer of hope that one day after a few decades passed and after many new governments passed, Russian and Ukrainian people could still be friendly towards one another, the 2022 invasion happened and cemented bad will towards one another. This time the stakes were even higher than in 2014 and many, many more were killed. There are very few in Ukraine who haven't lost a close friend or family member to the war. Such deep roots into the psyche of a nation can remain there for a long, long time. There are countless examples in history where two nations after a war on such a scale entered a vicious circle of hate. Such hate remains in society handed down to the future generations. So decades into the future neither Ukrainians nor Russians are likely to have a kind word for one another. Ultimately Russia has lost an opportunity to work, trade and live with its most immediate neighbor one which was culturally intertwined with Russia, much more than Russia could say for its other neighbors. Ukraine was once a country of 40 million people, a very close big market for Russia to rely on. This war may end up with a stalemate and a truce, that currently seems plausible 
if the West does not up its game and start sending serious military aid, enough for reorganization of Ukraine's military and enough for further mass offensives. In that low volume aid scenario where Ukraine gets enough aid just to defend itself, Russia will have gained something, probably enough to claim for itself to be victorious. Of course, everything else we said here can be used to claim it lost even more due to the war. It's only if the West cuts even more of its aid and leaves Ukraine on its own that Russia might eventually take even bigger chunks of Ukraine's territory. Once upon a time, Ukraine and Russia might have regarded each other as friends, someone to rely on in times of need. But after this invasion, Russia squandered that. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.